high. Right now, at this moment, uh, in this conference, all lives are stuck in the room. Uh, there are 400 people who are studying. There is another session going on about how we track ships and satellites and everything. That is another heavyweight session. Uh, so therefore, uh, right now, there are three or more like most attractive sessions going on in this conference. But right now, again, we are talking in this session about one of the most important factors in this world right now that deals with lives of many who uh, lives with us. We are talking about human rights at home, and we have three wonderful journalists who uncovered human rights abuses in their own countries. Let it be forced disappearances, let it be extrajudicial killings, let it be held, climate change, migration, conflict, and many other things. In every other country in this world, as occupancy is rising, as there are more populism, there are more hate crimes, there are more dislocation of people, displacements. So there is more human rights violations. As long as there is more human rights violations, there is more need for journalists to cover these issues. And I have with me uh, Mariko Suji from Japan, who was in the Chronicle. I have with me uh, Andrea Lee. Uh, she is from Agencia Pública. And I have with me uh, Rona Express. Uh, she is in Sci-Fi Spanish editor. And all of these journalists have uh, unearthed something that is very important for their country and also very important for other journalists around the world. And I'm sure they will share their experiences in a way that can help us and understand us like, why human rights, covering human rights, and investigating human rights abuses is important in this world. So I, I won't tell much more. I'm Mila Jamaturi. I'm GIDS Founder Editor. I'm Head of Program of MRI, the Foundation India Development Organization. I have the honor to moderate this session. And this session is being translated in French. So, uh, so if anyone is interested, uh, there is translation available. I would like to ask Andrea first to share her experiences uh, of their investigations. Uh, so, uh, hello, I am Andrea G. I am a reporter for Publica, Agency of Investigative Journalism in Brazil. Uh, Publica was founded in 2011 by women reporters and is the first non profit investigative journalism agency in Brazil, the Evangelicals in Brazil. Anyone who wants to know more about it can reach me later because we don't have much time. But Bolsonaro himself was a member of the Evangelical Bench before being elected president, although he was never a very prominent and caucus man. The first time I wrote about this was in 2015 in this investigation, the Pastors of Congress. Uh, we wanted to understand how these politicians emerged with each the churches, the negotiations, how they were elected, how they came into the parties, what their agenda. So I spent a few days at the Congress, knocked on the door of every evangelical parliamentarian, interviewed pastors, and attended an evangelical service in the House of Representatives, this, which was a surreal experience, something like this. This is in Congress. I think what Andrea was trying to talk about is like, uh, for investigating human rights, sometimes cross-border collaborations can be more effective and yes. working in teams can be, uh, can give you more in depth and better stories. Uh, on this point, I want to reach out to Mariko, uh, who will uh, investigate uh, in their own context in Japan, and you can share your story and experiences.
And after this like discussion, uh, I think sporting events we hear from them, then we, we discuss among ourselves about our situations. And if you have any questions. So good morning everyone. Morning. <laughs> He's my boss. <laughs> and my goal is the boss electronical, which is independent, not profit um, uh, investigative newsroom in Japan. So thank you for coming here today. So first of all, I'll explain about the impact of our story. On April in this year, Japanese central government legislated from compensating to those who have civil rights under the law. It paid 320 million yen per victim. And Prime Minister Shinzo Abe officially apologized for them. And when we started the story, uh, look, we said the phrases as a core of our story. So that is, uh, can you imagine a situation where persons who are very dear to you were sterilized at the time without consent? Or if you were sterilized yourself by the national government? So, um, let me show you what happened about forced sterilization in Japan. Three years after the World War II, Japan enacted the 1948 Eugenic Protection Law. Uh, this allowed the national and local governments to forcibly sterilize mentally and or intellectually disabled persons. The law was decided by politicians who were pursuing the liberation of the Japanese race. In 1996, the law was amended to ban involuntary sterilization. During the many years, the number of victims were up to more than 16,000. Please take a look at the table. I'm aware of the fact that they underwent surgery. The number of victims are predicted to exist much more than the government showed. And surprisingly, local government, which forcibly sterilized uh, victims, compete to each other, increasing the number of surgeries done under pressure from situation, they were willing to do so. On this uh, PowerPoint, Hokkaido Prefecture, for example, published memorial magazine when the number of surgery reached 100. Here is another example. A Indian Prefecture located northeast of Japan scored a little number of surgery for the first time. Therefore, many arts intelligent people like local, local judges, prosecutors, doctors, lawyers, and executive of mass media to build a school for mentally and intellectually disabled children. In addition to this, they got money for students to build this school and undergo even more surgeries. Consequently, Miami has been the top of the number of surgeries for three years since 1961. <coughs> We got these facts through the Japanese Freedom Act, Information Act. We requested the disclosure of information to all of 47 prefectures, and it took eight months to correct all documents. According to our research, even some people who didn't have disability also operated. Let me show you this picture. This is the illustration uh, on the book published in 1958. Uh, this was written by a doctor of mental illness. The title was The Figure of Mental Disabled People. Doctor described dis disabled people like this. We also revealed that children from poverty can be targeted by the authority. The victim of woman 
William Camille, who was sterilized when she was 14, didn't have any illness or mental problems. Her family was poor. Also, uh, victim included 2,300 children as young as 9 years old. As we saw the uh, background about this story, we found one important point. It is that everyone might become icon. There were many good persons who got involved for the sterilization. One of the physicians who operated many sterilizing surgery used to help to give birth of many children and send babies photo to their mothers, which he took. And his wife and colleagues regarded him as a very warm and kind person. Um, of course, the member who made eugenic profession of white people. However, once at once, many normal people promoted it as a job and with no uh, scouts. Similar things happen in other countries and it's under the same social structure among all over the world. Post-sterilization had already occurred in Western countries since 1920s. United States, Canada, Germany, Sudan, or Australia, South America, and North Western countries like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, which are known as a, uh, countries with general welfare, also did. Indeed, in the latest case, 30,000 victims of Peru are fighting against their government. Post-sterilization is not the past problem. So, uh, what should we do next? If you are interested in this issue, please research and investigate it in your country. And we'd like to make interview videos of victims all over the world with foreign, uh, foreign journalists. That's because many hidden victims who cannot confess their pain still exist. In Japan, only few people speak about themselves. Even national government decided to compensate for them. So I hope the voices of victims would encourage other victims to talk about it. So thank you so much for your attention. Please note my address or uh, Facebook and contact with me and Marcella Chronicle. And I also want to say that uh, now we are going to do a survey about the conference, in, in this conference about the situation of frontline journalism and questions like how to manage your organization or how to educate young journalists or how to collaborate to other uh, organizations or something like that. So please let me know if, if you can we have to correct many answers. That's all, thanks so much. Thank you, Mike. Back with our incredible people. Uh, so, good news. And from, uh, from Mike, we learned that uh, it's a poor, it's a woman, it's a child who are the main victims of universal abuses in the most of the world. Now we go to Rona, and she has uh, she has recently investigated the uh, a wonderful story in Brazil and the honor of human rights abuses um, from the authority, and that is shortlisted for the Global Shining Light Award as well. I am going to say that journalists are the best people
arrive uh, at my home. There is no food. There are no medicines. There is no freedom of migration. There is forced migration. There are some
panelist, if you have ever heard about uh, forced sterilization in your own country, I see. I've heard about it. I guess there's even a movie about it. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. In other country, have you ever heard about forced sterilization in the past? Uh, from which, I'm, as she told, uh, Mariko is very interested in future collaboration in this issue, forced sterilization uh, in, the, uh, in other countries other than Japan. And uh, as she said, uh, uh, we have uh, here voices of victims uh, of forced sterilization uh, all over the world. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wasata Chronicle is trying to reach out to the world and finding collab uh, collaboration partners who, who are interested in forced collaborations. And I think already you have got three countries named like Czech Republic, Sweden, and Finland, where there are instances in the past of these similar incidents. Thank you very much. With that note, I want to conclude this session and thank you very much, our uh, wonderful guests and speakers. Uh, and thank you, everyone who attended this session, leaving the most like gorgeous sessions in elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you.